Well, amen, church. Good morning. Uh, 50 degrees and breezy never felt so good, did it, right? It's like, <laughs> praise the Lord. Hey, before we get started, I just need to pause and let you know how proud of you I am as your pastor. Guys, on, uh, it, it, was, it was Wednesday night. We were having continued freezing temperatures and just all across the region, we kept hearing about busted pipes and lack of water and lack of power. And so we sent out the bat signal and decided to open up the hub uh, for the next three days. And we would end up having more than 100 people and families come through to take showers and to get water and to get warm and all of those things. And as Gary announced earlier, we had more than 70 volunteers jump up and sit up at the hub and bring food and uh, bake pizzas and grilled cheese and all sorts of things like that. So guys, just as your pastor, it is fun, guys, to be the hands and feet of the Lord. Amen. Amen. You'll see this morning I am preaching in my kids Share the Love t-shirt. They've got an, an awesome campaign as we ramp up for, uh, for the spring, moving towards Easter, inviting their friends. Uh, if, they, if they invited and brought a friend, then they and their friend got a t-shirt this morning. And so they're doing all sorts of other fun stuff in the, uh, uh, in the children's and youth department this morning. All right. Turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 1. John chapter 1, we're taking a break from our every spiritual blessing. Don't worry, we will come back to that next week. That means you have a week off to just kind of relax and rememorize. Those of you who are going through uh, Ephesians 1, 3 through 14, you should have received one of these on your way in the door. If you did not, just slip up your hand, and we've got some ushers who are walking around who are going to pass one of these out to you. But you're going to need one of these. Just keep your hand up as we get started. John chapter 1. If you are at home and watching online, uh, you can download these resources that I'm going to be referring to at the end of the service. They are there online with an easy downloadable tab. Uh, if you uh, so desire, you can come by the church office and pick up these resources uh, this week. Guys, this morning's a special morning. The sermon title is Who's Your One? Who's your one? And we're going to circle around at the end, and I'm going to talk about this a little more. But this morning, we're going to be looking at the life of Andrew the Apostle. May not know a whole lot about Andrew the Apostle, and truth be told, as we will find, uh, there's very little that Scripture and history record about Andrew. But what is highlighted, we're going to focus on this morning, and it's going to be inc incredibly impactful Listen as I read John chapter 1, beginning in verse 35 through 42. John writes, Again, the next day John was standing with two of his disciples. That would be John the Baptist. And he looked at Jesus as he walked and said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. And Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, what do you seek? They said to him, Rabbi, which is translated means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying and they stayed with him that day for it was about the 10th hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He found uh, he found first his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which translated means Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which translated means Peter. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we come to you in your word this morning. God, always in need of hearing a word from you, of having your Holy Spirit speak to our hearts to open our eyes so that we might know you better, so that we, we might walk with you, so that we might press into who you are and what you would have us do. This morning, 
we pray and we ask for your conviction, Holy Spirit. Conviction that comes from you, not from the pastor, not from our neighbors or any sort of subconscious, but rather a conviction that comes from you because you so empower us when you convict us. We want to walk worthy of you. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have ever heard of the name Edward Kimball, but he is the Sunday school teacher who led D.L. Moody to Christ. Dwight, at the age of 18, began attending his Sunday school class. Now, you need to understand that when, when uh, Moody first showed up, he was, he was crude, he was illiterate, and he knew almost nothing about the Bible, much less about salvation through Jesus Christ. And Kimball, as the Sunday school teacher, after Moody had showed up several weeks, he began to feel pressed by the Holy Spirit that he needed to go share Jesus with this young man. And so he worked up the courage one day that he was going to go to Dwight's work. Dwight worked at a Boston uh, shoe store and shaking in his boots, Kimball got the courage and got up and began to walk down to his work. Now, along the way, you can imagine the thoughts that begin to swirl through his head. He writes, when I was nearly there, I began wondering if I should go in during business hours. What if I embarrass the boy? What if the other clerks ask him who I was? While I was pondering over it, I pass by the store without noticing. And then he begins to wonder, maybe I shouldn't go back. Maybe that was fortuitous that it just passed by. But then before I had known it, I had dashed inside. Kimball found Moody in the stock room and spoke with him in his words with limping words. Later he said, I never could even remember what I said. Something about Christ and about his love. He admittedly said it was a weak, pathetic attempt. And yet right there in that stock room, D.L. Moody gave his life and his heart to Jesus Christ. Amen. Tens of thousands would ultimately be led to salvation through D.L. Moody's ministry establishing and founding the Moody Bible Institute that to this day has trained thousands for ministry. And it all began with a timid, shy, quiet, fearful man who overcame his fear to be faithful, to share, and to be obedient to the one that God was calling him to. Andrew is forever known as the younger brother of Peter. He is introduced in all four Gospels as Peter's brother. Andrew, who's that? Oh, you know, it's, it's Peter's brother. <laughs> oh, that Peter, he's quite a character. Whatever happened to Andrew anyways? forever known by his relationship to someone important. Andrew, like Peter, was born in Bethsaida of Galilee, a small fishing village along the Sea of Galilee. We know very little of his family, but that his father's name was John. I say he's Peter's younger brother solely from the fact that when you are introduced to the scene in Luke chapter 5, it's Peter's boat, and Peter is fishing with all the gang. Andrew is there, but he's not even mentioned until the next chapter in Luke chapter 6, where he is again introduced as Peter's brother. Always Peter's brother. His name means manly, which is quite fitting for a fisherman from Galilee who floats in the background, especially behind Peter. 
Peter is loud and impulsive, stricken with foot and mouth disease. But Peter is also the first among the apostles. In Jesus' inner circle, there on the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter would stand up at Pentecost and 3,000 saved. Peter would stand up at the, uh, the Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15, thereby swaying and making the influence that, that uh, the Gentiles don't have to follow the Mosaic law. Peter would stand up leading thousands to faith. Peter would write two epistles of the New Testament. Meanwhile, Andrew simply floats in the background, happily serves in the background. You know the type, don't you? The ones who just want to serve and be behind the scenes. Church history will record very little of his life. His name only pops up a few times in the New Testament outside of just the list of the apostles. But did you know there is no Peter as we know him without Andrew? You see, because it was, it was Andrew who brought Peter to Jesus. Think about that. How magnificent. John 1 tells us that Andrew was a disciple of John the Baptist. As John the Baptist began preaching along the, the Jordan River out in the wilderness for uh, six months to a year, that Andrew was out there. As John is preparing the way for the Lord, calling all to repentance, baptizing them in the Jordan, saying, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. It's right around the corner. The Messiah is about to come. And then one day, John looks up, gets the word from the Holy Spirit, and says, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Andrew is right there. Now catch the magnificence of this detail in 137. That two of John the Baptist's disciples, when they hear him say, behold the Lamb of God, they begin to follow Jesus home. Now what everyone else was doing, I don't know. But you do get this sense in some of the confusion. John even has disciples afterwards who are a little upset that Jesus is having so many followers. And here in this scene, there are only two who follow Jesus that day. One of them unnamed. People give a guess. Maybe it was John the Apostle, who's writing the story because he commonly left out his name, and the other, Andrew. Andrew. Heard John the Baptist say, behold, the Lamb of God, and then begins to follow Jesus home that day. Jesus is walking ahead, turns and notices there are two disciples following him, turns and says, what do you seek? To which they reply, where are you staying? Which is just another way to say, we want to hang out with you today. And so they do. They spend the day with Jesus. They get him all to themselves. Listening to stories, asking questions, laughing, sharing a meal. And by the end of the day, Andrew is convinced that God is with Jesus, that there is something special about him, that the Holy Spirit is on him in a special, unique way. You can't make too much of it because it's so early in the Gospels, and yet Andrew is compelled 
compelled. The moment that he leaves there, what does he do? What does he do? He goes and he grabs Peter. Verses 41 and 42. We have found the Messiah. And he brings Peter to Jesus. What an incredible picture of something that each of us is called to do as a disciple of Jesus Christ. You see, Andrew wasn't prone to stand up and shout it from the rooftops. That wasn't his style. That wasn't his personality. No, rather, Andrew is intentional with individual people. Not the crowds, just one. Just one at a time bringing them to Jesus. I want you to notice Andrew's intentionality. He was so overjoyed at spending the day with Jesus that as soon as he left, he thought of Peter. It's the first thing on his mind. He thought of Peter. Notice he doesn't just pray for Peter. No, no, no. He goes and gets Peter. Grabs him by the shirt. We found the Messiah. There's excitement in his voice. It's permeating. He is thrilled. And he doesn't stop there. He brings Peter to Jesus. Amen. Right? He drags him. Come on. What are you waiting on? Let's go. We found the Messiah. Notice his intentionality. Did you know that somewhere between 75 to 90% of all people who come to faith in Jesus Christ come through a friend. 75 to 90%. That means three out of every four people that are in heaven give overwhelming credit to a friend. For all the attention that Peter and D.L. Moody get, three out of every four say, do you know it was an Andrew or an Edward Kimball that brought me to faith? How magnificent is that? The one-on-one -on -one relationships, the kind invitation of a friend all because someone cared to invite them to Jesus. Her name was Rosa, a beautiful pastor's wife, dignified, well-spoken, intelligent. You would never know by looking at her about her broken past. She married at a young age to an abusive man. For years, her life was a living hell. She did not know Jesus. Rather, all she knew was of fighting and screaming and the fear she had for her own children. And then one day, in a small town, they came across a small town pastor who knew their name and invited them to church. And you know, they ex exchanged the pleasantries, all with no real intention of ever showing up. The pastor would occasionally come to their house, knock on the door, only to have them hit the lights, everyone be quiet, shh. Embarrassingly, he could hear them. But he still kept being persistent and showing up and inviting. And then one day they began attending. Not all the time, you know, just sporadically. And then one day Rosa heard the gospel. Amen. The truth that the deepest need in her entire life 
was to have fellowship and a connection with Jesus Christ. That her biggest problem was her own sin that had separated her. But God had loved her and sent his son to die in her stead so that she could have relationship and fellowship with God because her sins could be forgiven. When she heard that message, and of course at the end of the service, the pastor called and said, whoever wants to respond, I'll be down here at the front. Well, what burned inside of her She knew that she needed that hope, that that hope in Jesus was everything she longed for. But she also knew that she'd have to walk by her husband on her way out of the pew. And that in doing that, there would be a huge confrontation whenever they got home. So filled with nervousness and fear, She took a deep breath and went, pushed him aside and began to walk down the aisle so that she could receive Jesus Christ as her personal savior. Little did she know that her husband was following right behind and that he too would get saved that day. That she would become a pastor's wife because he would become a pastor. All because... One individual was persistent in inviting them. Let me ask you a question. What would it have looked like if Andrew didn't go get Peter and bring him to Jesus? Think about that. What would it have looked like if Andrew didn't go? You see, more than anything, that would be a statement about Andrew's own heart. What you see is that Andrew was so excited that he just had to go get Peter. He just had to. He had spent the day with Jesus. He just had to. Do you remember the story of the four lepers in 2 Kings chapter 7? Samaria was under siege from the king of Aram. Syria had come up against them causing a great famine in the city. Now, a great famine is a drastic understatement. In fact, the details are so horrific that I won't even share them with you. You you go to and read your Bible, how awful and disgusting it got in the city while they were under siege. But as the story continues, there are four lepers who are already outcast from the rest of the city. They weren't allowed to hang around. But they get the courage and the inkling that they're going to die of starvation anyway. So what do they have to lose? And they go out to the camp of the Syrians in hope of finding mercy. And as they go out there, the Lord had caused the Syrians to hear a sound, a multitude of an army. They all got scared and they all fled. So as the lepers go out there, what do they find? that they had left all their resources and all their food. And those starved half to death lepers begin to feast. Can you imagine how good that food tasted? And they ate and they ate and they ate and they had their fill. And then suddenly one of them said, You know, there's a whole city back there. We've got to tell them. This news is too good for us to just keep it to ourselves. We've got to go tell them. Church, we have been walking through the book of Ephesians where we have seen that in Jesus Christ, you and I have every spiritual blessing in in Christ. Every spiritual blessing in Christ. And we have been eating and feasting on the richness of God's goodness. It is overflowing, right? It is so compelling that you have been chosen, that you have been adopted, that you and I have been redeemed. 
Remember, we spent an entire time so that I could show you, you have every spiritual blessing so that the end result of that would be to the praise of his glorious grace. That as we feast, we cannot help but overflow to the praise of his glorious grace. Listen. To the praise of his glorious grace is not just when you are riding in your car alone listening to your favorite Michael W. Smith song. To the praise of his glorious grace is to your neighbor and to your coworker and to your family. It's the ultimate declaration. He is so good that I cannot help but proclaim the name of Jesus. Listen to me. God is not trying to guilt you into submission and to telling others about Jesus. You need to hear me say that. God is not trying to guilt you into submission. When a pastor gives a, hey, we should be evangelizing more sermon, everyone's like, all right, here we go. I know it's coming. God is not trying to guilt you into it. Have you ever been cornered by a grandparent who begins to show you pictures of their grandchildren. It's happened to me a number of times, particularly stuck on a plane, and and then here it goes, right? Did you know at no point in that conversation nearing the end have I ever had a grandmother go, you know, I've got a quota. I've got to tell so many people about and show these pictures or my kids get mad at me. Why? Why? Because they do it out of joy. Because they do it out of joy. Church, what does it say of us if we never share Jesus out of joy? If we never get around to the joy overflowing of telling other people what Jesus is doing in our lives, what does that say about us? It says we need revival. That's what it says. It says we need revival, that something is wrong in our hearts. If if Andrew spends the entire day with Jesus and then says, eh, either Jesus is not the Messiah or something is wrong with Andrew's heart. If you have been walking with him, showing up to church religiously, checking all the boxes, but he is not your joy. He is not your delight. It doesn't overflow from you. Look, I I, I know there are hills and valleys in life. Like, Like we get that. I'm not trying to be legalistic. There are, there are times when you're on the mountaintop. There are times when you're in, in the valley. But here's the deal. He is our joy. He is our delight. It ultimately has to come out of your pores or there's something wrong. We need revival. We need revival. You say, but pastor, who am I? I don't have the words to say. What could I possibly have to give? You know, the one other significant time that Andrew appears in the scripture in in a narrative is in John chapter 6. And and you're probably quite familiar with the scene because this is when Jesus feeds the 5,000. It's 5,000 men, probably close to 10 to 12,000 people in total. And, and this, this, the masses have been up on a hillside listening to Jesus teach all day about the kingdom of God. They are hungry to hear the word of God. And near the end of the day, Jesus turns to his disciples and said, I don't want to send them home hungry. Let's feed them. Now, naturally, the disciples are in a bit of a panic. Their, their mind is racing, okay? They're starting to add up the money 
And uh, it says, Philip starts to do the math, right? He starts to do the math, and he's like, wait a second here, Jesus. All right, we've got this many people, this much money, that much bread. Where are we going to find all that? Okay? But Peter, or sorry, but Andrew. But Andrew. In the middle of this situation, but Andrew, listen to what it says in chapter 6, verses 8 and 9. One of his disciples, Andrew, again, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are these for so many people? Now, first, I want you to notice that Andrew is not a simpleton. He knows that what they have in that moment is infinitely too small to feed 12,000 people, okay? He's not a simpleton. And yet, it was all they had. It was all they had. Andrew went and found this young boy who had his lunch there, had five little barley loaves and two fish, and brought him back to Jesus and said, Obviously, this isn't enough, but it's all we have. Listen to me, church. God is not asking you to save anybody. He's not asking you to save anybody. Only the Holy Spirit of God can do that. Okay? Only Jesus saves and the Holy Spirit opens eyes and changes hearts. God is not asking you to save anybody. Did you know Jesus didn't have to use this guy's, this young boy's lunch? But he did. The creator of the universe, who's about to feed 12,000 people, did not have to use the lunch. But imagine if you're that boy and you gave your lunch, you gave all you had, and you got to see what God could do with your little bit. God didn't have to use Andrew to save Peter, but he did. God didn't have to use Edward Kimball to save D.L. Moody, but he did. God didn't have to use Matt Sutter to invite me to the power team, but he did. It's the incredible truth, church, that you and I get to be used by an almighty God, that he invites us to participate and to partake in the greatest joy and delight that there ever was. He allows us to take part. He uses our little bit, our five loaves and two fish, into the kingdom of the beloved son. He uses us. Andrew spent the day with Jesus and was compelled to go get Peter. You see, in that moment, Peter was his one. The one person that God had burdened Andrew's heart for. It wasn't shouting to the masses, Rather, it was just one. Who's your one? Who's your one? That God has placed in your path, that God has began to burden your heart for, that you are willing to give your five loaves and two fish for that you are willing to begin to pray and to seek that God might move. Who's your one? I want you to watch this short video titled Malachi's Story. 
and see the way that God used this young man for a Hoosier one. Well, we named him Malachi after the prophet Malachi in the Old Testament, um, and his name means my messenger. He never met a stranger, he was so inquisitive, would talk to anybody, and... That was him from day one. I mean, that, that's never changed. Even until he took his last breath, he was always that way. He, Malachi loved sports, and he loved soccer. And at night, he started to complain that, he's like, Dad, my leg hurts. So I went to a friend who, you know, has a clinic here and they got finished and the doctor came to the door and he just, you know, he knocked and it's that moment you don't want as a parent where he's like, hey, I need you to come talk to me. So I went down to the office and sat down and he, he just looked at me and he said, there's two to three small masses in the base of his spine. We need you to uh, take him to Atlanta today. But that Saturday morning, they, they had about, it was about two and a half, almost three hour surgery. And he just said, like, the likelihood of this being cancer is pretty high. So. That was a very hard moment. I mean, not to just say it as it is, but the average lifespan was 17 months. Mm. He was in the hospital for 45 days. And he just immediately, when you go back and you start looking at kind of some of the stuff that he wrote down, Malachi could have just said, like, I'm done. February 2nd, 2019, I said, just let me die. That's what I said. There's no point in laying in a bed doing nothing. My dad said, I'm alive probably today still because I have a story even at age 12. I have a testimony. As parents, you can encourage your kids to do something. But in that situation, he had to make a decision. And he chose how he was going to walk it out. The Lord has given me so many chances to share the gospel, and I'm going to take every chance I can. The world needs Jesus. I want to step my game up because this thing, cancer, it can kill me. So I need to tell as many people as I can. Every day, Monday through Friday, when we would go for radiation, he would have to be transported in an ambulance. And so every day we had two new people that we spent about four hours with. And Malachi shared the gospel every day to those new people. I mean, he would lay in the back of that, on that stretcher in that ambulance. So where are you from and what do you do? But Malachi was just so bold and I think that was kind of one of the gifts of cancer, was that it really brought an awareness of life and death. I mean, you get a cancer diagnosis and it's, what do you have to lose? I mean, you know, like really, what, I mean, what do you have to lose? The body of believers at our church is amazing. We rolled out the Who's Your One initiative and that was one of the things that fueled that list. He just literally went through the list of people that he knew that needed Jesus. And I, I'm just going to write them down. I'm going to fight for them. And gosh, for him, he it's, it just took it seriously because he, he saw the finish line in front of him. The end of August, we went uh, for a scan and it had spread to his brain. And so our prayers shifted from Lord, sustain him, you know, to cheering him on to the finish line. And so when he, when he took his last breath, I just remember thinking, like right now, he's with Christ. Yeah, we, we hung on to that passage of in the garden where he's like, take this cup, please take this cup. Um, but if it's your will, and so we just we just drank of whatever the Lord gave us and trusted that the end would be for His glory. Well, 
What would happen if we as a church would spend the next four weeks, 28 days, together committed, asking God for our one? And praying for it. So here's the ask. Because at the end of the day, I want to be a church that seeks the lost, that goes after the one. We're asking for you to take this, to take these home. And to begin and to write down your one right here on this line. It's a bookmark and a prayer guide. And every day at one o'clock, would you pray for one minute for your one? One, one, one. Set a reminder on your phone. Every day at one o'clock, the members of this church praying for their one at one o'clock for one minute. What is God going to do if you and I, like Andrew, go and get our brother Peter, remembering it's not us who saves them, and yet he chooses to use us. We get to pray for We get to fight for those around us. Would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, I pray right now as a church, as we begin four weeks of who's your one, that you would, as only you can, draw to our minds that one, coworker, neighbor, family member, even enemy that you want us to be praying for and that you want us to be courageous for. Father, we admit our ability Five loaves and two fish. How can we feed 12,000? And yet we are committing to you right now, Jesus, that we will give you what we have. So that you can seek and save the lost. Father, as we pray and as we move towards Easter, Would you start a revival? And may it begin with me. That as we move as a church towards Easter, that we would see the lost come to faith in you. That we would hear stories and testimonies of what only you could do. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.